nice and easy. Then bring it out. He said nice and easy. You heard that? We are here in the world headquarters of Haas Formula One, and we're about to shoot some technical footage and insights, hopefully, onto the VF16, Haas's first Formula One car. Why are you kicking your beautiful book? Okay, so I can do that. Is there a reason why the GPW of 1942 booklet is in the building? Yes, it's because fundamentally, airflow along the flanks of a Ford GPW, or Willys MB, is, according to Daniel Bernoulli, exactly the same airflow that would be used across the flanks of a Formula One car. Yeah, it's even me, I quick you put your mic on. <laughs> <laughs> are we? Okay. Good to go. Yeah, are they? In this way, yeah. <laughs> Hello there, I'm Steve Matchett, and this gentleman needs no introduction. Gunther Steiner, team principal of Haas S1. Gunther, thank you for doing this with us today. This came around because Gunther and I had lunch about a week or so ago, and we just started to talk about my idea of getting a YouTube channel together. And Gunther said, why don't you come down and shoot one of the cars at Haas? So as we know absolutely nothing, about YouTube, we thought the best thing we could possibly do is go straight into a Formula One facility and shoot an F1 car with a team principal. Gunther, thanks for that. No, it's a pleasure. If you don't know how to do it, just do it and find out if it is good or not, you know? Just it's the easiest it. way. Just do it, you yeah. know? We're going to look at the 2016 <clears throat> VF16 car. This was your first car introducing the team into Formula One. Tell us something about the challenges that you face with this car. I think more than just with this car, it was the challenges of entering a new team to F1. That was the biggest challenge, I would say. Obviously, a car is the challenge behind it, but uh, being the first year to build up a new F1 team from scratch, it isn't easy. If I would go back, would I do it again? Maybe not. But anyway, as I said, it's the same with the YouTube thing. You learn and yeah. then you improve. But no, the challenge was for us at the time, it was not a specific this car, it was specific how can you make a, an F1 team run and obviously, the whole team did a great job. And to get this car ready for Australia, I don't know how many nights were spent, how many weekends were spent from the guys to, to do all this. So there is nothing specific for us on this car. We just said, we need to make an F1 car and we need to go racing in Australia. Otherwise, it ends badly. Well, it didn't end badly. You did get the car together. And my understanding is by excellent use of the sporting and technical regulations, you and your engineers and Eric Dampers have figured out that, hey, why are we building a lot of these components ourselves? We have nothing to work on, no data to work on. So you can start to work on the next year's car if you've got some data. You guys didn't have any data. Why don't we go to Maranello and try and use as much as that partnership as we can generate to use and the equipment around the car for instance, I'm thinking the suspension, the transmission, the engine, all Maranello componentry, and that must have helped you enormously. Absolutely, and now thinking back, and, and obviously hindsight is a beautiful thing, it was the only way to do it, in my opinion now, because, I mean, we have a complete facility here to build an F1 car, but they are so complex, these machines, and you know that, I mean, and they are getting more complex every, every year. Okay, what can we do in the regulations? And uh, at the time, Charlie Whiting was still with us, you know, and he helped a lot to clarify a lot of stuff, because there was a lot of clarification needed because nobody has done it ever before right. like this, you know. So we went into a territory, nobody had any answers. Obviously, they cleaned it up after we came through, you know. But uh, at the time, there was the possibility to do this. And it helped us not only getting to the first race, but it helped us also to be still around now and being a solid team in F1 this season. Yeah, And you made a tremendous mark on the sport when you arrived because but let's face it, how many teams have entered Formula One that have scored points in their debut? Not many. I can think of Toyota and Sauber before them. Sauber back in 93. You guys arrived in Australia with Grosjean managed to score points in the debut outing of a brand new car with a brand new team. And I remember you and I having a chat at Barcelona in the pre-season testing. And I said, hey, what's been your reaction from everybody else, Gunther, when you've arrived here? And you said, Everyone's just ignoring us, like they wouldn't even come down and say hello. But you made such an impact on the sport. You scored points in the first ranks. You know, Formula One is a tough business. There is a lot more naysayers 
than yes sales, you know? So we got a lot of that and they say, our business model, this can never work, guys. This will never work. You've got the facility in the UK, one in Italy, one in the States. Why would this ever work? And then we made it work, you know? So that again proves that uh, you need to be knowing what you're doing, stubborn to get to the end and not listen to other people or not, not listen. You have to listen to people. But if somebody's just there to say negative things, I ignore people, you know? So, and I say we made a mark. I think we had a very strong going until 2018 where we finished fifth in the championship. That sure. wasn't achieved many times before. Yeah. Then we had a little bit of a period where I don't want to talk about this 20 and 21, but we overcame that again, you know? And uh, I think we are back now to keep on going the right way, which is upwards. We've always had a very good working relationship. When I was at NBC doing the TV commentary, we got on very well. We've become good friends as a result of Formula One. So that's magic for me. I love that relationship. And Gunther, I'm going to ask you one thing as a friend now. I know you've got to go because you've got meetings. We have a camera here. Are you okay if you just leave us alone? I know no one else has ever done this, as far as I understand, ever. I'm going to ask this, and you can say no if you want to. Can you just leave us with the car so I can play around with the car and show the guys something on the car? As long as you don't touch it, you know. As long as you don't have a, a toolbox with spanners out there, then you can stay here, Steve. Otherwise, I need to stop, you know. Now, I, I'm more than happy that you explained to, the, to your viewers more about F1 cars because you are qualified to do that. Thank you. Do not take bits and pieces off, Steve. I, I may place my hands on the car if you're okay with yeah. that. I promise not to take anything off the car. Okay. All right, that will work. <laughs> Thank you very, very no much. Thank you. Guys, this is the 2016 Haas Formula One car. This is the book containing the regulations governing airflow from the FIA around the Formula One car. Well, actually it's not. It's a workshop manual for a Second World War Jeep, but it could be, that's, that's the point. It's probably bigger than that actually if it was the aero regs. So what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna take this opportunity to introduce you to airflow across a Formula One car from the leading edge of the front wing to the trailing edge of the rear wing and just give you an idea of what the engineers, the aerodynamicists and the mechanics are facing every time they're working on a Formula One car. It's important to remember on a Formula One car that every single component relies upon the next component. So part A touches part B, touches part C, on and on and on and on. So what happens at the rear of the car in terms of the efficiency of their rear wing starts right here at the leading edge of the front wing. And what the aerodynamicists are most concerned with is controlling the quality of the air as it flows along the flanks of the chassis, the top of the chassis, the underside of the chassis towards the rear wing. Fundamentally, controlling the quality of that airflow is key to what the aerodynamicists are trying to do because the rear wing is the biggest component really for producing downforce on the car. If you lose the quality of the rear wing, you will lose the quality of the airflow across the whole car. And the reason I say that is simply this, we're looking for aero balance. We can't just have the front wing doing all the work and a very poor quality airflow at the rear of the car because you'll take all the stability away from the rear of the car. You'll have great aero efficiency at the front, but the rear of the car will start to slide. Conversely, if we had a terrific rear wing and the front wing was failing, well, it's the opposite effect. We'd have no control over the front of the car and all the aero grip, all the aero loading would be on the rear wing. Can't do that. We're looking for airflow uniformly across the whole car, again, from the leading edge of the front wing to the trailing edge of the rear wing. Now, I understand some of you will be familiar, if not very familiar, with aero layout of Formula One car, but I'm also trying to explain what I know about aerodynamics to folks who are unfamiliar with it. So bear with me if some of the terminology you think, well, I'm very familiar with this, why is Steve telling me this? It's because I want to speak to everybody. I want everybody to be included with what we're doing here. When we talk about the leading edge, it's this component right here, the very front part of the wing. The trailing edge, conversely, is the area at the back of it here. So 
When the wing first contacts the airflow, in an ideal world, that leading edge of the front wing will be in undisturbed air. And that's exactly what we want. Flows across the front wing, it will start to spill into turbulence. And this is the key that aerodynamicists are always fighting with with Formula One design, is controlling the turbulence, controlling the quality of the airflow as it moves rearward. Now, very basically, the aero across a Formula One car works exactly the same as the aero flow across an aircraft's wing. We simply turn the principle upside down. What Daniel Benilla is trying to explain is this. If you speed airflow up across one surface of a wing, you will reduce its pressure, okay? And then the top surface on a Formula One car has greater pressure as a result of that and will push the wing down. Now, in terms of an aircraft, that's doing exactly the same, but of course the aircraft wing works in the opposite way. We want to create lift on an aircraft wing and there the aircraft soars effortlessly into the air. All we do on a Formula One car, turn that principle upside down and the more speed we have, the more velocity, the more airflow across the wing, car is pushed into the ground. Clean airflow is uh, sometimes difficult to understand because we can't see it. But here's a little example I hope will help. Imagine flying in an aircraft and you're in clean, undisturbed air, how smooth that flight is as you're going from one side of the country to the other. But when you hit turbulence and the plane starts to jump up and down like this, it's because the wings are en encountering turbulent airflow. It's all spilling around up in the clouds. The wings don't know what to make of it. They get into sort of this panic mode and, this car and the wings start to flutter. And obviously you feel that inside the plane. Translate that to what's happening down here on a Formula One car, and it's exactly the same. That turbulent airflow is bad. There's nothing, we don't like anything about it, and we want to control it. So when you look a holistic approach at the entirety of a Formula One car, every single component is there to try and control the quality of the airflow as it leaves the trailing edge of the front wing. As we move back then from the front wing, from the cascade elements, and the main element of the front wing, the first thing that we encounter are the brake ducts. Now these are essential to stop the brakes bursting into flames. And the mechanical engineers don't like that. They want their brakes not to burst into flames because the opposite is a bad day at the office. But the aerodynamicists would rather they didn't exist because they're simply in the way of the airflow. They don't like it being there. And this is where we encounter the situation of compromise and compromise across a Formula One car is everywhere. So they want it to be as small as possible. A smaller duct will create less turbulence, less of a problem for the aero guys. The mechanical engineers, well, they would prefer that to be twice the size because then they've got additional cooling and it gives them more scope, more room to play with the cooling of the brakes. But of course, the aero goes like that. So we come up with the minimum size that will just stop the brakes from bursting into flames. And you'll notice sometimes when the cars come into a pit for a pit stop, that the brakes immediately start to start smoking. And that is because without airflow going across that braking system, they generate so much heat on the inside, they will self-ignite. So that's the first component. And then we'll flow back towards where the camera mountains would have been. And these are also aero profiled shape to control that airflow. The air moves backwards. And then we start to encounter the front suspension. And you'll notice that the components of the front suspension, the top wishbones, the lower wishbones, and the push rods, they're all aero profiled as well, okay? And that again is to control as much as possible the quality of that airflow as it starts to move back along the flanks of the car. Now, the regulations, one of the regulations, says that we cannot have any movable aerodynamic devices other than the DRS on the rear wing. So the suspension cannot produce downforce. If the suspension produced downforce, it would be classed as a movable aerodynamic device and it would be a bad day at the office. The FIA wouldn't like it. The engineers would have to redesign it. But there is nothing to prevent the aerodynamicists and the mechanical engineers and the composite experts working on the shape of these components to produce as little drag as possible. So downforce is a great thing in terms of aerodynamic airflow, 
but you don't get something for nothing. You never do in life. A great martini is good the night before, but the hangover the next day is what you, the price you pay for it. Downforce is a wonderful thing in terms of aero assistance on a Formula One car, but the downside of that is it comes with drag. And drag is literally the physical resistance of the car driving through the air. So if the aero guys and the mechanical engineers, the composite experts can design their front suspension system here to reduce as much drag as possible, but not to produce downforce, that's a good day at the office. And that's what we see here. Then the air starts to flow backwards from the front suspension towards the keel of the car. And we encounter this component down here. James, if you come around here, I'll just show you that right here, which is known as the tea tray or the front keel of the car right here. Now on another episode, we'll get into exactly why historically we still have this componentry here, but let's just say for now it exists and we have to deal with it. So the airflow flows along this part of the car to the keel of the car, and James, if you come around here, and I'll point down this side here, you will see right here where my hand is, this is absolutely shaped just like the keel of a boat. Like the very front, the prow of the boat entering the water, this component here is entering the airflow. It's exactly the same. It goes back to Daniel Benoit's principles of um, hydrodynamics. We're dealing with airflow, we're dealing with water flow. Essentially, it's the same thing. So now as the air reaches this part of the chassis, just where we start to encounter the cockpit, the air will split to the left and to the right. We're moving back a little further, and then we start to encounter the radiator ducts on the car. We need these radiator ducts here because we need to cool the engine and the transmission and all the other componentry, the hydraulics which are hidden underneath the bodywork. Again, the aerodynamicists would rather they not be there. The mechanical engineers want them to be there because it prevents the engine bursting into flame, just like we need to prevent the brakes bursting into flames. And so compromise is reached. We come up with a design which is just big enough to cool everything underneath the bodywork, but create as minimal drag as possible. Sometimes the teams get that wrong, and you'll see them starting to open up bodywork venting on the car to improve airflow crosses on a very hot day, on a very hot track. Perhaps there isn't enough cooling, but boy, oh boy, I would say the aerodynamics have done remarkable work over the last few years to really control the quality of the airflow as it moves back underneath the bodywork. If you look back to the 1990s, for example, and you look at the openings for the ducts, for the radiator cooling, they are considerably bigger, considerably greater surface area to cool the components under there. But these guys these days have done so much stellar work in controlling that airflow, they managed to close it right down. Here's the next big point. We're about halfway across the chassis now. And again, we're still absolutely focused on controlling the attachment of the airflow. We don't want any of that air to start spiraling off and spilling into turbulence. Bad thing. Must have the airflow being linear, laminar airflow across the car, following the bodywork as much as possible without spilling off into turbulence. If we come around here, James, just at the side of the radiator duct, you'll notice this undercut here. It's very pronounced on the car as we hit this part of the chassis here, and we start to see the air fold its way back and control. Now, you can actually imagine exactly what's happening here. As the airflow has left the front wing and it's gone down the flanks of the chassis over the front suspension, some of it is fed into the duct to cool the componentry underneath the bodywork, and the rest is either channeled underneath the car or it's flying around here. And if you follow this line back, you'll notice it right underneath where the Haas lettering is. It's following in a perfect channel. As much as the regulations will allow, we are channeling, following that air all the way back right round here towards the rear suspension. And we don't need to go into an awful lot of detail about the design of the rear suspension. Suffice to say, naturally, it's made to be as low drag as possible. It's designed in the same way as the front suspension. But here's the key that the aerodynamicists are very keen to explore. We want to keep that air away from this rear tire as much as possible. 
The turbulence and wake from the tires are an absolute nightmare to an aerodynamicist in Formula One. There's nothing much we can do about it because the regulations insist it's an open wheel formula. And in a perfect world, the first thing the aerodynamicist would do would be to enclose the front tires and the rear tires, and you'd end up with a bodywork design which would look like a sports car. Perfect aerodynamic profiling, but we can't do that in Formula One. So we have to live with what the rules give us. That's always been a problem. It's a challenge of Formula One design. So knowing that this awful flat-sided tire here is charging into the air and producing clouds of turbulent air, we want to control the air that we can coming from the front, channel it back. We want to keep it away from here. This is bad news for airflow. Remember what we were saying before, we are absolutely focused on the quality of the airflow hitting the leading edge of the rear wing. So this is why the mechanical engineers and the aerodynamicists have worked in harmony so well over the years to reduce the physical size of everything as far as possible underneath the bodywork. Now they do that for one very good reason. It allows the bodywork to sit as tight as possible to the transmission and the differential and the drive shafts underneath here. That means that we can channel our air coming from the front, remember, all the way down here and keep it away from this awful thing here. We don't want to get involved with this. Keep away from that. So our clean airflow is coming around here and it's coming around here and it's flying across the top of the car here. And then it will hit the suspension components at the back, also aerodynamically shaped. It will flow across them again without callers and is you're going to get turbulence but we're trying to control that turbulence and then we can split it away and float out the back of the car now in terms of what's happening at the rear wing nothing is perfect and we're bound to get turbulence across a car it's just the way it is but we have worked tirelessly endless all-nighters endless computer simulations endless wind tunnel work to make sure that when the airflow comes across the flanks of the car here, across the bodywork, across the shark fin, it encounters this, the leading edge of the rear wing with a minimal amount of disruption. Then we can float across the elements of the wing to the trailing edge, across the rear wing end plates, and finally, we can throw it out the back. And in that way, we have controlled as much as possible the high quality airflow around the rear wing. This, as we've said, is the leading edge of the rear wing. There is no paint on that part of the wing. That is critical and it's by design. The paint line for the livery starts 10, 12 millimeters back from that surface because we don't want the rear wing here to suffer from aero erosion from sand and become pitted on the paintwork because that will affect the quality of the wing. So we want to keep that as far as possible, clean, simple, controlled lines. Don't put any paint on it. And I imagine if we look on the underside, James, here, if we later on we'll probably pick it up in B-roll, there is no paint on the underside of that wing. Cameras are not gonna pick it up. And in an ideal world, the car wouldn't be painted anyway, but we have to do that because that's what pays the bills in Formula One. It's a 200 mile an hour billboard at the end of the day. We need that money to pay everybody to produce the car. So that's why um, there's no paint on here on the leading edge and it will flow across here. Once again, the underside of the wing basically is a further distance, a greater distance than the air flowing across the top side of the wing. Fundamentally, if we have two air molecules hitting this wing at the same time, one traveling across the top surface of the wing and one traveling on the underside of the wing, to make sure that everything equals in a perfect world, those two air molecules must meet at the same time, okay, at the, at the trailing edge of the rear wing. So if the air molecule traveling on the underside of the wing has to go a greater distance than the air traveling across the top of the wing, the air on the underside needs to travel faster. More distance in the same time means an increase in speed. An increase in speed of that air on the underside lowers the pressure of the airflow. In contrast, 
the airflow across the top, therefore, air pressure across the top, as this drops down, this pressure increases relative to what's happening on the underside, and that's pushing the car down through the pylons, through the suspension to the road. And now I'm gonna give just a quick reversal, James, and just go back. And as we, as we go backwards, we'll just we'll go across again what we've talked about. So there's the rear wing that we're trying to keep in clean airflow as much as possible. That's why the bodywork is so tightly controlled around here is because we don't want that airflow that we're talking about here to contact the rear tires. That's why the bodywork is shaped as it is around here because we're funneling the air back from the front wing. So that's why we have these sharp undercuts around the radiator ducts. We need the radiator ducts to stop the engine bursting into the flames. We come back to the front suspension. Now we can't produce downforce, but we're trying to get low drag design off that front suspension system. That worked well. We come back to the front brake ducts. Mechanical engineers do want them to control the temperature of the brakes. The aero guys don't want them. So we come compromise there. We come back to the front wing, the trailing edge, the front edge, and there it is. So A touches B, touches C, touches D. So when you look at one component, don't just take that in isolation. Yes, look at it in isolation, decide, I like it, I don't like this, I can see what the air is doing around here. But imagine what's happening behind it. What's happening behind that? What's happening behind that? Hope you enjoyed that, guys. Pass, I have to say, have given us unprecedented access to their Formula One car. I have never known a Formula One team, and I've been around the sport now for the best part of 40 years. I have never known a Formula One team, thank you to Gunther Steiner, to simply say, Steve, how about the car? We're gonna leave you alone, talk about anything, touch anything. We, we really don't mind. We can trust you to do this. And I want to say a huge thank you to Haas for doing that. And that is how we know with relative certainty that if ducks float, well, they must be made of wood. Join us again next week for another episode of Interesting Things. Thank you guys for watching. Yeah, done, right, all right. We're, our contract is over. Get in the plane and take me away. Thank you for showing me. Yeah, Sorry to stop you from your flight. <laughs>